In a world dominated by the colossal might of Rome, one man emerged from the city of Carthage with a vision and strategy unlike any other. Before the tales of Napoleon's strategies or Alexander's vast empire, there was a genius whose name echoed with respect and fear in the corridors of Roman power. With an army of diverse mercenaries and the unforgettable sight of war elephants crossing the Alps, he embarked on a campaign that would be studied by military minds for millennia. Dive deep with us into the life, battles, and unparalleled genius of Hannibal Barca, the audacious tactician who not only changed the face of warfare, but also dared to challenge the very essence of Roman dominance. The name Hannibal wasn't unique to the legendary general we know today. It was a popular name among the Phoenician Carthaginians, written in their sources as NBL. This name is a fusion of Hanno, a typical Phoenician male name, and Baal, a significant deity from their ancestral homeland of Phoenicia in Western Asia. While the exact pronunciation of the name remains debated, interpretations like the grace of Baal or Baal is gracious give us a glimpse into its meaning. The Greeks, in their records, referred to him as Anubis. Interestingly, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians, like many Semitic cultures of West Asia, didn't have family surnames as we understand them. Instead, they used patronymics or descriptors to differentiate individuals with the same name. So, while Hannibal is the most renowned bearer of that name, he's often distinguished as Hannibal, son of Hamilcar or Hannibal the Barsid. The term Barsid refers to his father's family, with Barca meaning lightning or thunderbolt. This name was given to Hamilcar due to the intensity and speed of his military campaigns. This term, Barca, shares roots with other Semitic names symbolizing lightning. Even though the title wasn't hereditary, Hamilcar's descendants are often collectively termed the Barsids. It's worth noting that modern historians might use names like Hasdrubal Barca or Mago Barca to differentiate them from other Carthaginians with similar names, but this isn't a historically accurate practice. Hannibal, the legendary Carthaginian general, was born in what we now recognize as northern Tunisia. This region was one of the many Mediterranean areas settled by the Canaanites, who originated from Phoenicia, aligning with the modern-day coasts of Lebanon and Syria. Hannibal's lineage was notable. He was the son of the Carthaginian leader, Hamilcar Barca, and had several sisters, whose names remain a mystery, and two brothers, Hasdrubal and Mago. Additionally, he was related by marriage to Hasdrubal the Fair and the Numidian king, Naravas, who became key allies during the early military campaigns of the Barca family. Following Carthage's loss in the First Punic War, Hamilcar was determined to restore the prestige of both his family and Carthage. With the backing of Gades, he embarked on a mission to subdue the tribes of the Iberian Peninsula, which corresponds to modern-day Spain and Portugal. However, Carthage's resources were so depleted that Hamilcar had to lead his army on foot across Numidia, heading towards the Pillars of Hercules, before crossing the Strait of Gibraltar. A poignant tale from Hannibal's youth, as recounted by the historian Polybius, tells of a young Hannibal, just nine years old, pleading with his father to accompany him to war. In a dramatic gesture, Hamilcar brought his son to a sacrificial chamber, held him over the flames, and made him vow eternal enmity towards Rome. Some accounts even have Hannibal declaring, as soon as age allows, I will use fire and steel to halt the fate of Rome. Legend places this solemn oath in the town of Paniscola in present-day Spain. As Hamilcar continued his conquests in Hispania, tragedy struck when he perished in battle. Leadership then passed to Hannibal's brother-in-law, Hasdrubal the Fair. At this time, a young 18-year-old Hannibal served as an officer under Hasdrubal. Prioritizing stability, Hasdrubal signed an agreement with Rome, setting territorial boundaries. He also worked diligently to strengthen Carthage's ties with the indigenous tribes of Iberia and the native Berbers along the North African shores. When Hasdrubal met his untimely end in 221 BC, the army, seeing the potential in the young 26-year-old Hannibal, proclaimed him their commander-in-chief. This decision was later ratified by the Carthaginian government. The Roman historian Livy paints a vivid picture of Hannibal, describing him as a mirror image of his father, Hamilcar, in his youth. Soldiers saw in him the same fiery spirit, the same commanding presence, and the same determination. 
Livy's accounts also mention Hannibal's marriage to a woman from Castulo, a significant Spanish city allied with Carthage. The Roman poet Silius Italicus identifies her as Emils. While Silius hints at a Greek background for Emils, other scholars argue for a Punic origin based on linguistic evidence. Silius also alludes to a son, though this claim isn't universally accepted or supported by other historical sources. Upon taking the reins of command, Hannibal spent the next two years fortifying his territories and furthering Carthage's control in Hispania, particularly south of the Ebro River. His initial campaign saw him overpower the Alcades, leading to their swift surrender. Subsequent campaigns against the Vacchii showcased his military prowess, especially at the Battle of the River Tagus. However, Rome grew wary of Hannibal's increasing influence and formed an alliance with Saguntum, a city well south of the Ebro. Hannibal viewed this as a treaty violation and, already harboring intentions of challenging Rome, saw this as his cue. After an eight-month siege, Saguntum fell to him. In a strategic move, Hannibal sent the spoils from Saguntum to Carthage, earning him significant political favor. Only a few, like Hanno II the Great, opposed him. Rome's Senate, alarmed by Hannibal's audacity, sent envoys to Carthage. They questioned whether Hannibal's actions were sanctioned by the Carthaginian government. The Carthaginians responded with legal technicalities, pointing out the treaty's lack of formal ratification. The Roman envoy, Quintus Fabius Maximus Viriacosus, presented Carthage with a stark choice, war or peace. The Carthaginians threw the decision back at Rome, and Fabius declared war. The blueprint for Hannibal's audacious journey into Italy was initially conceived by his brother-in-law, Hasdrubal the Fair, who had been a key Carthaginian figure in the Iberian Peninsula since 229 BC. However, by 221 BC, Hasdrubal's assassination thrust Hannibal into the spotlight. The Romans, sensing a brewing alliance between Carthage and the Celts in northern Italy's Pavali, took preemptive action. By 220 BC, they had annexed the region, naming it Cisalpine Gaul. Upon Hannibal's arrival in the Pavali, he was bolstered by approximately 10,000 Celtic warriors. The Romans, perhaps complacent after thwarting the perceived Gallo-Carthaginian threat and aware of Hasdrubal's demise, were caught off guard. Hannibal embarked on his legendary journey from Cartagena, Spain. In the spring of 218 BC, he masterfully navigated through hostile northern tribes, leaving a sizable force behind to maintain the newly conquered territories. By the time he reached the Pyrenees, he had a formidable force of 40,000 foot soldiers, 12,000 cavalry, and 38 elephants, although the treacherous Alps would claim many of these. Hannibal's journey was fraught with challenges. He had to cross not just the Pyrenees, but also the Alps and numerous significant rivers, all while navigating potential conflicts with the Gauls. By September, he reached the Rhone. His exact path through the Alps remains a topic of debate among scholars. Some evidence suggests he might have passed near the iconic Matterhorn. Others argue for different routes, like the Col de Clapier or Petit Mount Sanus. Recent findings, however, have pointed towards the Col de la Traversette as the most probable route, aligning with ancient descriptions and supported by archaeological evidence. Livy's accounts of the Alpine crossing paint a picture of immense hardship, with Hannibal even resorting to using vinegar and fire to break through rock barriers. By the time he descended into Italy, his forces were significantly diminished, with only 20,000 foot soldiers, 4,000 horsemen, and a handful of elephants remaining. Hannibal's military acumen was shaped by both his Greek education and first-hand experience under his father's command. His strategy was expansive. Instead of a direct assault on Rome, he aimed to weaken its allies and open a northern front. This strategy was rooted in the lessons from Carthage's defeat in the First Punic War. His vision culminated in the daring plan to invade Italy via the Alps, a move requiring the mobilization and provisioning of up to 100,000 troops and a unique war elephant corps. This monumental endeavor would reverberate throughout the Mediterranean for over two decades. Hannibal's audacious journey through the Alps not only allowed him to step onto Roman soil, but also caught the Romans off guard, preventing them from confronting him on foreign terrain. Moreover, his unexpected arrival in the Pavali swayed the Gauls there to abandon their recent allegiance to Rome and rally to his side. 
the Romans, under the command of Consul Publius Cornelius Scipio, hadn't anticipated an alpine crossing. They had been preparing for a showdown in the Iberian Peninsula. Despite being caught by surprise, Scipio's swift decision-making enabled him to quickly transport his army by sea to Italy, positioning them to confront Hannibal. The two forces first clashed at the Battle of Ticinus. Here, Hannibal's superior cavalry mastery forced the Romans to retreat from Lombardy's plains. While the victory was not a decisive one, it boosted the morale of the Gauls and Ligurians, prompting them to join Hannibal and replenishing his ranks to about 40,000. During this battle, Scipio was gravely wounded and was only saved due to the valiant efforts of his son, who charged back into the fray to rescue him. Scipio then regrouped his forces at Placentia. Meanwhile, Rome, sensing the gravity of the situation, dispatched another consular army to the Po Valley. Before the news of the setback at Ticinus even reached the capital, the Senate had directed Consul Tiberius Sempronius Longus, who was stationed in Sicily, to join forces with Scipio. Hannibal, always a step ahead, positioned himself strategically to intercept Sempronius. He seized Clastidium, securing vital supplies for his troops. However, Sempronius managed to evade Hannibal and linked up with Scipio near the Trebia River by Placentia. It was here, by the Trebia, that Hannibal showcased his unparalleled military genius. In December of that year, after methodically wearing down the Roman infantry, he executed a brilliant surprise attack, decimating the Roman forces with a perfectly timed ambush. In the winter, Hannibal found himself amidst the Gauls, whose loyalty had waned. To counter potential assassination attempts from these allies, he cleverly donned a series of disguises, constantly changing his appearance with various wigs. By spring 217 BC, Hannibal sought a more secure base in the south. Roman consuls, Gnaeus Servilius and Gaius Flaminius, anticipated Hannibal's march on Rome and positioned their armies to block his potential paths. Hannibal, however, chose a route through the marshy region at the Arno's mouth. Despite its challenges, it was the quickest way to central Italy. His troops endured a grueling four-day march through waterlogged terrain, during which Hannibal lost his right eye to an infection. Emerging from these hardships, he reached Etruria. To draw the Roman army into battle, Hannibal began ravaging the region. Flaminius, stationed at Aricium, was forced to act. In a bold move, Hannibal outflanked him, cutting him off from Rome. This maneuver led to the Battle of Lake Trasimene, where Hannibal masterfully ambushed and decimated the Roman forces, killing Flaminius. Despite this victory, Hannibal knew he couldn't besiege Rome without proper equipment. Instead, he roamed central and southern Italy, hoping to incite a widespread revolt against Rome. The Romans, in response, appointed Quintus Fabius Maximus Viriacosus as dictator. Fabius introduced a new strategy. Rather than confronting Hannibal directly, he kept his armies close, shadowing and restricting Hannibal's movements. Hannibal tried to provoke Fabius by devastating Campania. However, Fabius remained defensive, a tactic that many Romans viewed as cowardly. Finding himself trapped in Campania for the winter, Hannibal executed another masterstroke during the Battle of Ager Falernus. He used cattle with burning torches tied to their horns as a diversion, allowing his army to silently slip through an unguarded pass. This maneuver, a testament to Hannibal's genius, was lauded in many historical accounts and military manuals. Hannibal's cunning escape tarnished Fabius' reputation, and his dictatorial tenure soon ended. For the ensuing winter, Hannibal settled his army in the plains of Apulia. In the spring of 216 BC, Hannibal made a strategic move, capturing the significant supply depot at Cannae, positioning himself between Rome and its vital resources. The Romans, sensing the threat, assembled a massive army, possibly as large as 80,000 men, and marched to Apulia. They found Hannibal stationed by the Aufidus River. The two Roman consuls, Gaius Terentius Varro and Lucius Emilius Paulus, alternated command daily. On the day of the battle, the impulsive Varro was in charge, giving Hannibal the opportunity he needed. Hannibal masterfully manipulated the battlefield. He positioned his weakest troops in the center, drawing the Romans in, while his stronger troops on the flanks encircled the Roman legions. Hannibal's cavalry, led by Maharbal and Hanno, 
crushed the Roman flanks and attacked from behind. The Romans found themselves trapped, with no escape. The outcome was devastating for Rome. Between 50,000 to 70,000 Romans were either slain or captured. The Roman leadership was decimated, with the death of Paulus, two former consuls, and numerous other officials. This battle stands as one of history's bloodiest single-day conflicts. Post Cannae, Rome avoided direct confrontations with Hannibal, opting for a war of attrition. Despite his victory, Hannibal didn't march on Rome, possibly due to insufficient resources or siege equipment from Carthage. This decision led Maharbal to remark, Hannibal, you can win a fight but not exploit it. Following Cannae, many Italian regions, seeing Rome's vulnerability, sided with Hannibal. The Greek cities in Sicily revolted against Roman rule, and King Philip V of Macedonia allied with Hannibal, sparking the First Macedonian War. Hannibal also formed an alliance with Hieronymus of Syracuse. Some argue that with more support from Carthage, Hannibal could have directly attacked Rome. Instead, he established his base in Capua, the second largest Italian city. Yet, many Italian city-states Hannibal hoped would join him remained loyal to Rome. The situation in Italy had reached a deadlock. The Romans, learning from Fabius' tactics, realized that direct confrontation with Hannibal was not the answer. They adopted a strategy of attrition, the very tactic that earned Fabius the title Cunctator or the Delayer. Instead of seeking a decisive battle, the Romans harassed Hannibal's forces, aiming to wear them down and stir dissent within his ranks. This strategy meant that for years, Hannibal's operations in southern Italy were limited and lacked significant impact. While Hannibal did achieve some victories, destroying two Roman armies in 212 BC and even killing two consuls in 208 BC, he couldn't secure a game-changing triumph. Several factors contributed to this. His Italian allies were not as supportive as he had hoped, Carthage's government was not providing the necessary reinforcements, and Rome's vast resources and resilience were unmatched. The political dynamics in Carthage were complex. While there was a senate, real power lay with the council of thirty nobles and the hundred and four judges from the elite families. The city's politics were divided between two factions, the war party, associated with Hannibal's Barsid family, and the peace party, led by Hanno II the Great. It was Hanno who had previously thwarted Hannibal's request for reinforcements post Cannae. Hannibal's war against Rome wasn't fully endorsed by the Carthaginian elite from the start. His assault on Saguntum had forced the oligarchy into a difficult position, go to war with Rome or lose influence in Iberia. The oligarchy's interests were primarily commercial, and they controlled Carthage's strategic assets. Throughout the war, Hannibal desperately sought reinforcements, but the oligarchy prioritized Iberia and North Africa over his needs. As a result, as his seasoned troops fell in battle, they were replaced by less experienced mercenaries from Italy and Gaul. The Carthaginian oligarchy's commercial interests dictated their decisions, often to Hannibal's detriment. Hannibal's campaign in Italy, which began with so much promise and several stunning victories, started to wane as Rome adapted to his tactics and strategies. The capture of Tarentum was a significant achievement, but Hannibal's inability to secure its harbor was a setback. The subsequent events, including the sieges and battles around Capua, further demonstrated the resilience and determination of the Romans. Despite his tactical genius, Hannibal faced challenges that were insurmountable. The loss of Capua was a significant blow, and his march on Rome, while forcing the Romans to divert some troops, did not relieve the siege. Meanwhile, Rome was achieving successes elsewhere, notably in Sicily and against Philip V of Macedon, further stretching Carthaginian resources and attention. Hannibal's victories at the battles of Herdonia and Pedelia showcased his continued ability to defeat Roman armies in the field. However, the strategic situation was turning against him. The loss of territories and allies in Italy, combined with the devastating news of his brother Hasdrubal's defeat and death at the Matoris, meant that Hannibal's position in Italy became untenable. The gruesome delivery of Hasdrubal's head to Hannibal's camp was a chilling testament to Rome's resolve and a clear message of their intent to see the war through to its end. 
The final years of Hannibal's campaign in Italy were marked by a slow but steady Roman reconquest of the territories and allies that had previously fallen to Hannibal. His brother Mago's failure in Liguria and the unsuccessful negotiations with Philip V further isolated Hannibal. By 203 BC, the situation had become dire for Carthage. With Rome threatening Carthage itself, Hannibal was recalled from Italy to defend the homeland. This marked the end of his 15-year campaign in Italy, a campaign that had come close to defeating Rome but ultimately fell short. The stage was set for the final confrontation between Hannibal and Rome, with Scipio Africanus poised to bring the fight to Carthaginian soil. The Battle of Zama in 202 BC was the final and most decisive confrontation of the Second Punic War. After years of Hannibal wreaking havoc in Italy, the Romans were determined to end the conflict on their terms. The battle pitted two of antiquity's most celebrated generals against each other, Hannibal and Scipio Africanus. Scipio, having observed and learned from Hannibal's tactics in Italy, was well prepared for the encounter. He had also secured the alliance of the Numidian king Massinissa, whose cavalry would play a pivotal role in the battle. Hannibal's army, on the other hand, was a mix of his seasoned veterans from the Italian campaign and hastily levied Carthaginian recruits. Crucially, his war elephants, which he hoped would disrupt the Roman lines, were effectively countered by Scipio's tactics. The battle began with Hannibal's war elephants charging the Roman lines. Scipio had prepared for this by creating lanes in his formation, allowing the elephants to run through without causing significant disruption. Following this, the Carthaginian infantry engaged the Romans. While Hannibal's veterans in the center initially pushed back the Roman infantry, the Roman legions managed to hold their ground. The turning point came with the cavalry. Scipio's Numidian allies, under Massinissa, engaged and routed the Carthaginian cavalry, then swung around to attack Hannibal's infantry from the rear. This double envelopment, reminiscent of Hannibal's own tactics at Cannae, sealed the Carthaginian defeat. Hannibal managed to escape the battlefield, but the war was effectively over. Carthage's power was broken, and the city-state was subjected to harsh terms by Rome. Hannibal's legendary status, however, remained intact. Even in defeat, he was recognized as one of the greatest military minds in history. His tactics and strategies were studied by military leaders for centuries to come. The aftermath of Zama reshaped the Mediterranean world. Rome emerged as the dominant power, while Carthage, though it would survive for another 50 years, was a shadow of its former self. The seeds for the Third Punic War, which would result in the complete destruction of Carthage, were sown in the aftermath of Zama. The Battle of Zama marked the end of Carthage's status as a major power in the Mediterranean. The terms imposed on Carthage after the battle were harsh. They were stripped of their overseas territories, their fleet was limited to a mere ten ships, and they were prohibited from raising an army without Rome's permission. Furthermore, Carthage was required to pay a large war indemnity to Rome over the next 50 years. Hannibal's tactics at Zama, while initially effective, were ultimately outmaneuvered by Scipio's flexibility and understanding of Carthaginian strategies. Scipio's ability to adapt to the situation, combined with his use of the Numidian cavalry, proved decisive. The betrayal of Massinissa and the defection of the Numidian cavalry, which had previously been one of the most effective components of Hannibal's army, was a significant factor in the Carthaginian defeat. After the battle, Hannibal's political career in Carthage was short-lived. He was elected as one of the Safites and initiated various reforms. However, his efforts to reform Carthage's oligarchy and reduce corruption made him many enemies. Facing charges, he chose to go into voluntary exile. Hannibal's legacy, however, was not forgotten. Despite his ultimate defeat, his military genius was recognized and studied by subsequent military leaders and strategists throughout history. His crossing of the Alps, his victories in Italy, and his ability to sustain a campaign far from home for over a decade became legendary. For Rome, the victory at Zama and the end of the Second Punic War marked the beginning of Roman dominance in the western Mediterranean. The defeat of Carthage, once their most formidable rival, 
paved the way for Rome's eventual conquests in the East and the establishment of the Roman Empire as the Mediterranean's unchallenged superpower. Hannibal's time with Persia's was his last active service in the Mediterranean theater. His military genius was still evident, and he was able to achieve victories even when not in his prime environment of the western Mediterranean. However, the shadow of Rome loomed large over his life. The Romans never forgot the terror he had brought to their doorstep, and they continued to view him as a threat, even in exile. Rome's influence was growing, and their network of allies and client states expanded. They exerted pressure on these states not to host or support their old enemy. As a result, Hannibal's movements were closely watched, and he was often on the move to avoid capture. Eventually, the Romans, wary of Hannibal's continued involvement in Mediterranean politics and his association with their enemies, demanded that Prusias hand him over. By this time, Hannibal was an old man, having spent a lifetime fighting against Rome. Rather than be paraded in a Roman triumph or executed in Rome, Hannibal chose to take his own life. According to Livy, Plutarch, and other historians, he poisoned himself in Labissa, in the eastern part of the Sea of Marmara, around 183 BC he left behind a letter declaring, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. Hannibal's death marked the end of an era. He was the fiercest enemy Rome had ever faced, and his tactics and strategies were studied by military leaders for centuries. Even in death, he was respected by his enemies. The Roman historian Cornelius Nepos remarked that Hannibal's great abilities were acknowledged by the very people who had fought against him for so long. His legacy as one of the greatest military commanders in history remains intact to this day. Hannibal's death, like many aspects of his life, is surrounded by a mix of historical facts, legends, and varying accounts. His end in exile, far from his homeland of Carthage, is a testament to the profound impact he had on the Roman psyche. Even in his final years, Rome saw him as a threat, a testament to the respect and fear he had earned during his campaigns in Italy. The various accounts of his death, whether by self-administered poison to avoid capture or due to a wound, all converge on the idea that Hannibal chose his own fate rather than letting the Romans dictate it. The prophecy mentioned by Appian, whether true or a later addition to his story, adds a layer of irony to his life's narrative. Hannibal, who had spent much of his life fighting Rome and its destiny, was himself caught in the web of a prophecy he misunderstood. The location of his tomb, while mentioned by ancient sources, has never been definitively identified in modern times. Like many great figures from antiquity, the exact location of his final resting place remains a mystery. Hannibal's legacy is undeniable. He is often studied for his military genius, particularly his crossing of the Alps and his victory at Cannae. His strategies and tactics have been analyzed and taught in military academies around the world. Beyond his military achievements, Hannibal's indomitable will, his lifelong resistance against one of the ancient world's superpowers, and his ability to inspire and lead diverse groups of people make him a figure of study and admiration to this day. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. We journeyed through the life of one of history's most formidable generals, Hannibal Barca, and his relentless challenge to the might of Rome. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. Your support helps us delve deeper into history's rich tapestry and bring it alive for you. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. As we sign off, the algorithm thinks you will enjoy this next video on the screen. Check it out and continue your journey through history with us.